Hello, welcome to Memo's weekly review show. I'm video producer Osman Butt, filling in for this week for our regular host, Nassim Ahmed, who will be returning to the show next week. As usual, joining us is Moin Rabani. Moin, welcome. Thank you very much, Osman. It's a pleasure to be with you. And it's our pleasure to have you. This week, we discuss Israel's twin assassinations in Lebanon and Iran, targeting Hezbollah commander Faoud Shakur and Hamas's political chief Ismail Haniya. The killings last week have sparked fears of a major regional escalation, as well as a derailing of the ceasefire negotiations. As we record this episode on Monday, the 5th of August, the world is waiting for an Iranian retaliation to last week's strike. But at this time of recording, it has not yet occurred. With this in mind, we will be assessing the potential impact. Also on today's show, as Al Jazeera's journalist and Cam, his camera, as Al Jazeera journalist um, uh, Ismail, uh, Ismail Al uh, Lagul and his cameraman Rami Al Rafi are killed in an Israeli strike, we will look at the significance of these deaths. We will also examine why Israel is ranching uh, up its attacks on schools and hospitals in Gaza. And lastly, the Gazan Health Ministry has updated its death toll to 39,623. But are all of these are all the bodies being counted? So, Moin, let us uh, begin with the big story from last week. Um, so, as much of our audience will no doubt be aware, there were at least two assassinations that occurred within a few hours of each other. Um, one in Beirut, targeting uh, Faoud Shakur, and another one a few hours later, targeting Ismail Haniya in Tehran. One's uh, obviously a Hezbollah commander, and the other is the chief of, uh, political chief in Hamas. So what exactly do we know about last week's strikes? Well, let me start by saying, um, in your introductory comments, you referred to fears of a um, full-scale regional conf conflagration and, and fears that these assassinations would derail negotiations for a ceasefire. I think that's true for most people. But there are others who have um, not fear, but hope that this will lead to a full-scale regional conf conflagration and hope that this will um, definitively derail the ceasefire negotiations. And I think it's, it's important to keep that in mind as we discuss uh, this issue. So what happened last week is um, that Israel um, uh, first launched an air raid on the southern suburbs of Beirut and managed to successfully assassinate Fuad uh, uh, Shukur, uh, the senior Hezbollah military commander. And he wasn't just any commander. He was, along with Ahmad Mughniya and Mustafa Badr al um, two uh, senior Hezbollah military commanders who were assassinated in 2008 and then a few years ago, respectively, considered um, uh, the three founding members of, of the first generation, if you will, of um, uh, the Islamic uh, resistance, uh, the military arm of Hezbollah. And um, if we look at the pattern of clashes uh, between Israel and, and Hezbollah since October 8th of last year, when Hezbollah launched its um, so-called support front in southern Lebanon, this exceeded um, uh, the existing rules of engagement, uh, such as they are, in significant ways. And these were enumerated by um, uh, the uh, Hezbollah general secretary, um, uh, Hassan Nasrallah. It was an attack in the Lebanese capital, uh, Beirut. It was an attack in a residential area of uh, Beirut. And it was an attack on a very senior Hezbollah leader. And Nasrallah made clear that um, there would be a reprisal by Hezbollah uh, to this attack, and that it would neither be indirect nor symbolic, um, but would be um, but would be a reprisal that has similar strategic significance. And he left us completely in in the dark 
about what that might be, I would say deliberately so. Then 12 hours later, um, the head of the Hamas Politburo, Ismail Haniya, was assassinated. And I think just as important as the fact of his assassination is the fact that the assassination took place in the Iranian capital, um, uh, Tehran, um, while he was an official guest of the Iranian government attending the inauguration of um, the new Iranian president, Bezeshkian, if I pronounce that correctly, uh, a few days earlier, and was staying at a uh, guest house um, uh, that is operated by the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps. And the Iranian response, um, uh, at least what they have stated uh, so far, has been um, uh, no less unambiguous than that of Hezbollah. And what the Iranians are basically saying is that in April, the Israelis bombed an Iranian diplomatic facility in the Syrian capital, uh, Damascus. The Iranians uh, responded with the first direct attack since 1979 from Iranian territory onto Israeli territory. And as most observers have concluded, um, uh, that uh, uh, that salvo of, of drones and missiles was deliberately calibrated to, on the one hand, send a clear message to Israel, don't do this again, um, but at the same time to uh, produce only limited damage so that there would be no further escalation. And so, you know, while the world thought it was on the brink of another full-scale Middle East war in April, um, the nature of the um, uh, Iranian reprisal to the Israeli attack on uh, the Iranian facility in Damascus and Israel's subsequent um, uh, limited uh, response to that reprisal pulled us back from, uh, from the brink. And what the Iranians are now saying is that um, our response in April had a primary purpose, which was to deter Israel from undertaking such attacks again. Well, what has Israel done now? It has not just attacked an Iranian um, uh, a diplomatic facility abroad, but it has attacked in Iran, the, Tehran, the Iranian capital. It has, um, in doing so, killed an important guest of the Iranian government. And so what the Iranians are saying is, not only are we going to respond, but we are this time going to respond much more powerfully um, in order to clearly deter Israel uh, from um, undertaking similar attacks um, uh, in the future. You know, we're now speaking on um, uh, Monday, August 5th, at a time when neither Hezbollah nor Iran have um, uh, yet launched their anticipated reprisals uh, for these um, uh, twin attacks. So at this point, we do not know if there will indeed be an attack, although that seems 99.99% certain. We do not yet know the nature of that attack in the sense of will it be a coordinated attack um, by uh, Hezbollah, Iran, and other members of the self-styled axis uh, of resistance, or will it be a series of uh, separate attacks? Nor do we know um, uh, what exactly they will do. My suspicion is that what Iran and Hezbollah and their coalition partners um, uh, would like to do would be to attack Israel in a way that if it does not respond, it will appear weak and deterred. Um, and if it does respond, then it would be an Israeli responsibility for the further escalation um, that takes place. And, and, and here I would just like to refer to um, uh, the Lebanese analyst, Ali Haider, uh, speaking on one of the Arab satellite um, uh, channels a few days ago. He said, you know, the, the fundamental issue here is that neither Iran nor Israel nor Hezbollah want a full-scale war, but in defending what they perceive as their vital interests, um, uh, they are prepared to risk a war in order to 
defend those um, uh, interests. And the Iranians have said as much, you know, those who are now calling for restraint should have been calling for restraint before the situation got out of hand. And we are now going to take measures to ensure that Israel um, conducts itself in a more restrained manner in future. And if that leads to a war, um, that is not our responsibility, and so be it, if, uh, is, is effectively what they're saying. Indeed. And obviously, you know, we've got, we're still, as you've said, we're still sort of waiting to see what might happen. But of course, um, so before we sort of get to the sort of wider potential impact of this, I'd like to take a moment to focus a little bit on the two figures that were assassinated last week, Fawad Shakur and uh, ha Ismail Haniyeh. I mean, Haniyeh, if we start with him, you know, he is, you know, he's been a very important figure within Hamas for a long time, many decades. He was briefly prime minister of the PA in 2006 to 2007 and was ousted in part by that uh, 2007 fight between Hamas and Fatar. Um, and he essentially was, you know, effectively de facto prime minister of Gaza up until I think 2017. Um, and he's when Yahya Sinwa replaced him and he's been, you know, part of the committee, the political committee for Hamas, based mostly in Doha, up until um, up until sort of now. Um, but how important was Haniya? Not so much just in the past, but how much was he going to be important going forward? Because as you might have seen, some Israeli anal uh, analysts have been saying he was being prepared to become PA PM Prime Prime Minister again. Um, I, I don't agree with that. Last statement, and I'll get to why I don't think um, that was uh, a realistic supposition in a moment. But first, about um, uh, these these two who have been assassinated. For Ad Shukur of Hezbollah, we've we've already um, uh, discussed. Um, so he was an absolutely central figure in the Islamic re resistance, um, the the military wing of the uh, Hezbollah movement. As far as Ismail Haniya is concerned, um, he goes way back in terms of his involvement in Hamas. Um, he first rose to prominence as um, essentially the uh, personal assistant of Sheikh Ahmad Yassin, um, the founding leader of, uh, of Hamas, who you may recall was a paraplegic and it was always Ismail Haniya who, who was um, uh, pushing him around in his wheelchair, arranging his meetings and so on. So he was very much his private assistant. And um, uh, then, in, um, and, and Yassin, of course, was assassinated by uh, Israel in the Gaza Strip in 2004. Um, Haniya, um, uh, a refugee who hails from the Shatat Beach refugee camp in the Gaza Strip, um, subsequently rose to prominence in 2006 as the leader of the um, slate of candidates Hamas put forward when it essentially reversed its um, decision on participation in Palestinian Authority elections and contested the 2006 Palestinian Legislative Council elections in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. At the time, um, uh, the view that was put forward was that um, uh, Haniya was very much a consensus candidate um, within um, uh, Hamas, and he seems to also have been a consensus candidate more broadly within Palestinian society, because, of course, uh, Hamas won those elections with a veto-proof uh, majority, and Haniya was uh, subsequently appointed as the prime minister of the Palestinian Authority, and after the violent schism um, in June of uh, 2007, Haniya continued as prime minister. But as you noted, he had been dismissed um, by the leadership of the Palestinian Authority in Ramallah, but maintained um, his role as uh, prime minister of the separate Palestinian Authority in the Gaza Strip. In other words, um, what's often referred to as the Hamas-run um, uh, government. And then in 2017, um, he was elected as, uh, as the head of the Hamas uh, Politburo. Now, 
the position of head of the Hamas Politburo had not been absolutely central to the movement um, uh, in previous years because when um, uh, Sheikh Ahmed Yassin uh, was alive, you know, he, he was the effective leader, um, even though he was not the head of the Politburo. And the Politburo was, in fact, initially established by Hamas um, to be based in exile to ensure the survival and continuation of the movement against the waves of Israeli assassination and, and, and repression in the occupied territories. But um, uh, Hamas has term limits for the head of its um, uh, Politburo. So in 2017, Khaled Mash'ad, his predecessor, uh, stepped down and was replaced by Haniya. And interestingly, not long thereafter, Haniya relocated um, uh, from the Gaza Strip to the Qatari capital, uh, Doha. So on the one hand, his election as Politburo chief can be seen as um, uh, a transfer of the center of gravity and the center of power within the movement to the Gaza Strip because that was the territory it controlled and ruled. But then at the same time, Haniya's relocation to Qatar from the Gaza Strip can also be seen perhaps as, as something of a diminution of his, of his uh, role, particularly um, in contrast to Yahya Sinwar, whose official position is not more than the local head of Hamas. In other words, um, uh, he is this, the senior official of that branch of Hamas in the Gaza Strip rather than of the movement as a whole, but has emerged as the most powerful and influential uh, leader within the entire movement. And Hania's role was um, uh, political rather than operational. Um, of course, the International uh, Criminal Court uh, prosecutor, uh, Karim Khan, was seeking his an arrest warrant for him uh, in response to the Hamas attacks on October 7th. Um, you know, now, of course, uh, there will not uh, um, uh, be an arrest warrant or a trial. Um, I don't know if there would have been had he survived this attack, but I think it would have been very difficult to make the case that he was um, uh, directly involved, arguably even aware of the um, uh, specific planning uh, for for those attacks. But um, nevertheless, you know, he he was a central uh, figure in Hamas. He was his removal from the scene will not, in my view, have a significant operational impact, if you will, on the movement, particularly not on its uh, military. Um, posture and capabilities in, in the Gaza Strip. And I think what's important to recognize here is that while Israel has been very successful at um, assassinating uh, Palestinian leaders and, and senior officials and cadres and so on, I mean, within Hamas alone, um, uh, Yassin was um, uh, assassinated some 40 days later, his successor, Abdel Aziz Rantisi was assassinated. Um, his successor, Khalid Mash'al, um, uh, barely survived um, an attempt, an assassination attempt conducted with chemical agents um, by the Israeli uh, Mossad intelligence agency on the streets of uh, Amman. Um, uh, and now uh, Mash'al's uh, successor, Hania, has been assassinated as well, to say nothing of all the other um, uh, Palestinian leaders uh, from, you know, various factions. And what we've seen is that while Israel is effective at assassinating individuals and leaders and officials and so on, and in fact um, has been doing this for decades on a systematic basis, it has been an absolute failure when it comes to actually defeating the movements that these people um, uh, lead. I mean, Hamas is, I think, a very good example of a movement that has lost so many of its key figures and leaders, but in the meantime, has only gone from strength to strength. I mean, when, when Yassin was assassinated, um, uh, Hamas didn't really have a rocket capability. It had the equivalent of tin cans that could barely make it over the Gaza-Israel boundary. Well, you know, look where it was on... Uh, October 7th, it didn't rule any territory in 2004. In 2006, um, 
it obtained a veto proof majority in, in, in uh, local Palestinian elections in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip um, and has ruled the Gaza Strip uh, since then. So, you know, um, it's, a, it's a significant blow. I mean, the, you know, the killing of any leader is going to be a significant blow any way you cut it. Um, it affects morale, I'm, I, I'm sure, um, but it has, it will not have, and this is equally true, I think, of previous um, assassinations, it will not have a long-term operational or political or organizational impact um, on Hamas. Yes, and it's um, interesting to think about this because, of course, he wasn't a central figure in the sense that he was running the show in Gaza. And so his assassination doesn't seem to serve any real purpose from the perspective of um, Israel trying to crush Hamas in Gaza. Um, but obviously it is an important event and an important symbolic event. Um, so what do you think in this particular case and in the case of Fawad Shukur, what was uh, Israel's intention here, you know, why were they carrying out this killing? I mean, obviously, right now we've got uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, who is, according to reports in the Israeli media, sitting in a recently constructed bunker by Shin Beit, waiting for a response. Um, so, what was his plan here? Why did he decide to do this? Well, I think it had um, uh, a number of related objectives. Um, you earlier mentioned um, the uh, Qatari and Egyptian mediated negotiations uh, for a ceasefire. And Hania, of course, had a prominent role in those negotiations. I believe that he was um, uh, the basically um, the de facto chief um, negotiator, or at least the one in charge of the Palestinian negotiating team. Now, you know, if you want negotiations to reach a successful conclusion, um, you, you would probably not try to do so by assassinating the other side's chief negotiator. If you do do this, you're obviously hoping that the other side will um, refuse to negotiate further or that it will lead to um, some kind of crisis that lead to a breakdown in those negotiations. And, you know, anyone who has looked at this, aside from U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken, um, has concluded um, that Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has absolutely no interest in a successful conclusion of these negotiations and has repeatedly gone out of his way to sabotage them and to place um, uh, new demands and conditions and so on, not in order to achieve more in the negotiations, um, but in order to obstruct these negotiations and to ensure their failure. It's not only the Palestinians who are saying this. It's not only the Egyptian and Qatari uh, mediators who are saying this. We are now hearing those statements explicitly from senior Israeli politicians, from senior Israeli military and intelligence officials, and from those Netanyahu has selected and assigned to lead Israel in these negotiations. So, you know, unless you're Antony Blinken, this is something that is definitively um, beyond dispute. I think that was um, uh, the first uh, objective. What I don't think was happening is what some people have suggested, which is that the U.S. Um, uh, felt that Netanyahu or even that Israel felt um, that it could finally call it a day um, and end its genocidal campaign on the Gaza Strip um, only after it had acquired some significant achievements and that therefore the assassination of Shukur, the assassination of Hania, um, the almost simultaneous Israeli announcement that a July assassination attempt against the um, uh, Hamas uh, commander-in-chief in the Gaza Strip, Mohammed Leif, had been successful, that these gave Israel... Um, uh, let's say the prerequisites for you know what they consider um, uh, a dignified uh, exit, um, and, and that so that we should see this in the context of laying the groundwork for a ceasefire agreement, either because Israel has decided uh, upon one, 
or because the United States is now finally prepared um, uh, to read the riot act to its Israeli proxy and ensure that this um, uh, war comes to an end. I don't buy any of that. Um, uh, there's absolutely no evidence for it. And we can get into that later because I want to get back to your question about what Israel's objectives were. Well, I already gave you one, which is to sabotage rather than conclude uh, the ceasefire negotiations. Um, and the response from um, Hamas has been, yes, you did assassinate Hania, um, but you've also killed uh, some 40,000 uh, Palestinians. Um, we didn't stop negotiating when you killed the other 39,999 Palestinians. So we're not going to stop negotiating just because you killed a prominent leader of our um, uh, movement. But I think the second and more important objective that Israel is seeking to achieve is to provoke a full-scale regional war. Now, you would legitimately respond by saying, well, Israel is having so much trouble in the Gaza Strip. Why would it possibly now want to unleash a um, armed confrontation with a much more powerful um, Hezbollah um, on a second front and then in addition, open a third front with the conventional army of the Islamic Republic of Iran. And the answer to that is that if you look at what has been happening in the past 10 months, on each and every occasion, um, the United States has a stated policy of preventing regional escalation, um, which I believe it genuinely um, believes that I do believe Washington genuinely wants to avoid regional escalation. But at the same time, it has consistently enabled Israel to further escalate uh, regionally and on each and every occasion has jumped to Israel's defense um, to defend it against the consequences of Israeli actions that produce uh, further regional escalation. And given this pattern, I think Israel now sees um, uh, what it believes to be uh, perhaps a unique opportunity, something it has been trying to achieve for at least the last decade or two of, of um, provoking a direct military confrontation between the United States and Israel's enemies in the Middle East, chiefly um, uh, Iran. Um, and... So I, I, I do think they, they see this because I think the Israelis, looking at the pattern over the past 10 months, they understand that while it may be um, well and true that the United States has sent a clear message to Israel, if you are attacked, we will defend you. But if you initiate um, uh, a conflict, you're on your own. They know, and the U.S. has already demonstrated by sending additional ships and assets and bombs and all the rest of it, um, ammunition to Israel. Israel knows damn well that even if it is Israel that initiates and provokes a full-scale regional conflict, that the U.S. Um, uh, will do everything within its power to defend Israel against the repercussions of its actions, because the fundamental principle, the fundamental American principle here is this U.S. support for Israel is unconditional. There will never be repercussions or consequences for Israel for anything it does at any time to anyone anywhere. Um, and um, uh, the U.S. commitment to Israel's security is ironclad and unconditional. Um, it's, you know, um, so the only thing that, matters, you know, what Israel does, who it does it to, how it does it is completely irrelevant to U.S. calculations. The only relevant factor for the U.S. is that Israel must be defended at all costs. Now, this puts Israel obviously in a great position today, um, but you know, in the broader context, we have to remember the nature of the U.S.-Israeli um, uh, relationship. It's the U.S. that's a superpower, not Israel. It is Israel that is the proxy, not the United States. Israel's role in this relationship is to defend and promote Western interests in the Middle East. And what we're seeing instead is Israel having to be defended 
by its sponsors and allies um, uh, against those who it is supposed to keep in their place. And so I think this will have significant long-term um, uh, uh, repercussions on Western strategic perceptions of the value of Israel as a Western proxy um, uh, in the Middle East, as, as, as a state that is not only incapable of defending and promoting Western interests in the Middle East, but that can't even defend itself um, uh, without these Western powers that would really like to focus on Ukraine, on China, on whatever, having now to divert so much of their time and effort and resources um, uh, to defending Israel against a war with Iran, um, uh, potentially, of course, uh, that was initiated not by Tehran, but by Tel Aviv. Indeed. And what is, because um, obviously you've talked to us a little bit about what the impact might even be when you think about the future of Western strategic interests um, as a result of what might you know, become as a result of all of this. But what has struck you about the international reaction to all of this? I mean, you've mentioned the United States, where Anthony Blinken has effectively, you know, said, well, we don't really know if Israel did this or not, despite every other country thinking otherwise. We have yeah. also seen diplomatic efforts from Jordan and others. So in the last week, what has struck you most from the international response? You know, you know if, if, if Netanyahu stands up tomorrow before Congress, and says, um, uh, my intelligence agencies have confirmed that the moon is made out of cheese, you will get half of Congress ordering a plain cheese sandwich and the other half um, uh, putting mustard on their bread, waiting for the Mossad to bring them uh, cheese from the moon. And, 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 and Blinken is entirely of a piece with this. You know, um, for Blinken, Israel can do no wrong. Um, I think, you know, I've been criticized for saying this, but I think we have to understand um, that people like Joe Biden and Anthony Blinken, these are um, uh, politicians who belong to a certain age um, when um, anti-Arab racism and particularly anti-Palestinian racism were de rigueur for any successful uh, U.S. Um, uh, politician or senior official, and it's very, very deeply ingrained in their psyche, in their political soul, in their being. And so the question we need to ask about people like that is not whether um, uh, they have any pangs of conscience um, or, or, you know, whether they feel any shame about their role. I think we have to recognize that they're extraordinarily proud of what they're doing. It wouldn't surprise me that for Blinken, the Gaza genocide, he considers his finest hour. It wouldn't surprise me at all. I mean, you know, these people look upon Palestinian civilians um, uh, the same way the Grand Wizard of, of the Ku Klux Klan looks at people like Emmett Till. They're not human beings. When, when these people see the bodies of dismembered Palestinian children um, uh, blown to smithereens by U.S. weapons, they don't see dead children. They see a victory against terrorism. Um, that is that is where these people are coming from. And I think we need to stop pretending that we can in any way appeal to their better instincts or or to anything else and and finally recognize that they're not doing this because they feel they have no choice. Um, they're not doing this against their better judgment. They are all in. They are doing this out of conviction and they're extraordinarily proud of their of, of the result and in the case of someone like Blinken you know he at least goes through the motions but you look at Biden and he is absolutely unapologetic about it absolutely unapologetic um yes um he's he is his 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 uh, mental capacities appear to be 
increasingly uh, diminished to the extent that people are now questioning whether or not he is still a sentient being. But on this issue, his faculties are unaffected. Um, I would argue he's not doing this because he's losing capacity, but rather that if Biden was losing his mental capacities, U.S. policy might change for the better. But is but it is because Biden is so fully in control of himself on this issue. You know, this will probably be the last memory um, uh, uh, to leave uh, the space between his ears, the last conviction he holds. Um, it is because he is so firmly in control of his um, uh, of his capabilities that the policy is of 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 unconditional support for genocide against the Palestinian people is continuing. But I, I may have um, skipped over your question uh, in, in raising that point. Uh, yes, I was asking about international reaction and what's your yes. view. Sorry, yeah, getting right back. Um, so, well, the international reaction has, has been as it always has. You know, um, we don't want escalation. We absolutely don't want a regional war. And I'm sure that they don't want either. Um, and I'm sorry, when um, we say international reaction, of course, there is a reaction of the international community, um, uh, which by and large sees this uh, for uh, what it is. And then there is the response of um, the Western states, um, which have responded to um, these developments according to the principles of their rules-based international order. And the principles of the rules-based international order is, um, uh, you know, that, um, well, since it wasn't Iran that assassinated an Israeli leader, which would have been absolutely outrageous um, uh, and caused for war, but it was Israel assassinating a Palestinian leader in Iran, um, that's fine. That's self-defense. Uh, we're not going to, uh, you know, the U.S., Britain, and France uh, blocked a presidential statement about this issue in the UN Security Council, you know, imagine what we we we, don't, we haven't even read about that in our in our um, uh, newspapers. Imagine if Russia and China um, uh, had blocked a UN Security Council um, uh, statement that sought to uh, condemn Iran for you know assassinating uh, some. Uh, uh, leader of a foreign movement um, uh, in uh, in Tel Aviv. So, um, the international, the Western response has been, um, well, we may not like this, okay, but now that it has happened, the same people who have done absolutely nothing um, to promote, let's call it Israeli restraint for ten months, but to the contrary, have been providing Israel with weaponry, um, who have continued on a mass scale to import illegal products from the illegal settlements, who have done absolutely nothing to prevent their own citizens from, from playing a direct role in the um, Gaza genocide by serving in the um, Israeli military um, uh, and, and, and so on and so forth, um, who consider it perfectly normal and acceptable for their own citizens. Um, uh, to be illegal settlers in illegal settlements. And I could go on, uh, but I won't. Um, uh, um, you know, uh, now all of a sudden they have discovered uh, restraint. So they are reaching out to Iran and Hezbollah primarily and directly um, to urge them not to respond to the Israeli provocations. Well, it's to me absolutely clear um, that the U.S., um, at least had foreknowledge of these attacks, if not having been involved in their um, uh, planning. And you have a situation now where the West felt absolutely no need um, to impose restraint on Israel, but now considers it essential that Iran and Hezbollah uh, demonstrate uh, restraint. And I think it's partially for this reason that Iran and Hezbollah have basically... Um, uh, refused to accept these messages and told the messengers to go to hell. Um, uh, and then, you know, the other part of it is that, yes, um, the U.S. is so opposed 
to the prospect of further regional escalation that it is um, releasing uh, previously reserved um, uh, weapons uh, to the Israeli armory, um, that it is, you know, bleeding 24 hours a day about um, Israel, Israel's uh, right to defend itself. Um, uh, it is sending additional forces uh, to the Middle East with the explicit assignment of defending Israel against the consequences of its own actions. It is trying to um, reconstruct this um, coalition of of Western and regional states to defend Israel against the fallout from its own actions. So, um, you know, as I say, um, uh, <laughs> judge me by what I do and not what I say. Indeed, and Moin, we could spend forever talking about this topic. There's a lot to go through here, uh, whether it's uh, the international response, whether it's more about how the assassination was carried out, the intentions, or whether Biden is sentient or ever achieved sentience. Uh, these are all questions that we could ask, uh, but we do need to uh, move on um, because another major and significant event took place last week, um, and that is um, the killing of uh, two Al Jazeera employees, one journalist, Ismail Al Ghul, and his cameraman, Rami Al Rafi, who were killed. Um, you know, after an Israeli strike. Um, and, you know, aside from obviously the personal tragedy that this is and tragedy for the network, it also marks a grim milestone as this is likely to be the 120th uh, journalist killed in Gaza, according to the International Federation of Journalists since, of, since September, uh, since 7th of October. Um, and so what do you, you know, what does this sort of killing tell us of, of these journalists? What does this tell us about um, Israel's targeting of them? And, you know, how would how would you discuss, you know, how should we understand the situation for journalists in the besieged trip? Well, I think the first observation to make is that we now have definitive proof that Ismail al-Ghul was um, uh, deliberately assassinated by Israel in a premeditated attack. And how do we know this? Um, because the Israelis subsequently released a propaganda dossier um, in which it claimed showed that um, uh, Ismail al-Ghul was a member of Hamas. I can't remember whether he was a commander of its um, uh, nuclear submarine fleet or its space force. Um, uh, and, you know, this document was clearly a hoax because if this document was genuine, we have to believe several things. First of all, that the Qassam Brigades, uh, which is a clandestine um, armed movement that has um, uh, never operated publicly in the sense of a um, uh, conventional force or even um, the government security force in the Gaza Strip. We are being asked to believe that the Qassam Brigades um, maintain electronic files with the real names, identification numbers, um, um, and mugshots of each one of their members. It's, you know, if if Hamas or if the Qassam brigades actually maintain such records, trust me, they would no longer exist um, because each and every one of their members would have been um, uh, picked off uh, years before October 7th. October 7th um, uh, would have never happened and we wouldn't be having this conversation now. So we can, I think, state definitively that the so-called um, uh, registry of, of uh, Qassam members is a hoax. Secondly, you know, um, Israel has amplified certain um, uh, columns of al ghuls entry on this uh, supposed registry. Um, but what they didn't translate is that, according to this document, um, he has had a military rank within the Qassam Brigades since 2007. Well, he was born in 1997, so he would have been only 10 years old. You know, and even Napoleon and Alexander the Great didn't become active um, militarily until they were well into their teens. So again, 
it just um uh it just uh defies defies the imagination but you know israel knows that it only needs to put this information out there and there is an entire army of apologists and flunkies um who are just uh waiting um uh, who will uncritically accept and mass regurgitate um uh this uh hospita this uh, propaganda because you know they don't think for themselves um they let um the the military uh, the spokesperson of the israeli military and israeli officials do the thinking uh for them um and so it's it's quite clearly a deliberate premeditated assassination and you know part of it i think has to do with um uh israel's increasingly um fanatic um and hysterical campaign against al jazeera that's certainly the case um you know there was there was another um uh, al jazeera um uh correspondent i believe his name was ismail abu omar and the claim and and he was um uh attacked i believe by a drone in uh, Rafah this February he wasn't killed Israel subsequently put out reports about him um that he was the deputy commander of Hamas's uh, Khan Yunus battalion and as proof um uh put out a clip which purported to show him reporting um from beyond uh the boundary of the Gaza strip from somewhere in southern Israel in October 7th well my god have you ever heard of a correspondent reporting from a scene of a battle of course you haven't therefore it proves this guy is a Hamas battalion deputy commander so you know we are to believe um that the deputy commander of Hamas Hamas's Hanunis brigade on October 7th was was not dressed in military gear like the rest of the Hamas fighters on that day was sauntering around southern israel unarmed in civilian attire and reporting really if 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 Hamas battalion commanders were operating like that october 7th would have never happened and then we are supposed to believe um that um uh, abu omar you know he was he was um uh, severely wounded in um uh, Rafah in February when Israel was launching a major campaign in Khan Yunis so the question becomes well then what was the Hamas Khan Yunis battalion deputy commander doing in Rafah pretending to be a journalist you know when he should have been in uh, in Khan Yunis directing uh, the forces under his control and on top of that he subsequently was evacuated to Qatar for medical treatment through official cha channels and nothing and nobody gets into or out of the egyptian um palestinian uh crossing points at rafah without egyptian um uh, sorry without um prior israeli authorization and the same is the case for ismail al ghul you know he was um arrested and detained um by the israeli forces when they invaded um uh, al shifa uh, hospital you know the famous um um uh nuclear reactor of hamas in the gaza strip um and he was you know tortured beaten up and all the rest of it and subsequently um uh released well you know given that israel has been <laughs> torturing palestinians who were not hamas um to death in its um uh in its interrogation uh centers why would they be releasing someone who they know to be a uh Hamas uh, uh fighter a member of the Qassam brigade posing as a journalist you know none of it makes sense but again when you have an army of apologists and flunkies who let Israel do the thinking for them and are just waiting for this propaganda to begin uh, uh spreading it about you know we of course complain about um russian agitprop and, and and chinese agitprop but we love israeli agitprop we love it we wait for it with anticipation 
Um, so, you know, that's what's going on here. But there is one more element I, I would like to know, because it's not just about Al Jazeera. Um, an important reason that Israel is targeting and murdering on a scale unprecedented in modern armed conflict, according to the, commission, the Committee to Protect Journalists, um, is because these are the only journalists that are there. It is systematically preventing any other correspondents, whether Arab or European or North American or Asian or African or what, no one is allowed in. And the problem is you don't often hear um, the international media um, uh, even remind us that they are being systematically excluded from uh, entering the Gaza Strip by the Israelis. Um, and so in that context, these are the only people there. These are the only journalists reporting from the ground. And I'm sure at some level, um, Israel believes that if it can pick off a few very well-known prominent correspondents who are, you know, um, beamed into every Arab household on a daily basis, maybe then, you know, the freelancers, um, and and others uh, will think twice about preserving their own skin and leave the profession or find better things to do until this genocidal campaign comes to an end. But I think it is an enormous, it is an extraordinary testament um, uh, to the Palestinian press corps in the Gaza Strip, um, uh, particularly of Al Jazeera, but for that matter, anyone else, that they they have not abandoned um, uh, the profession. In fact, they have redoubled uh, their dedication to informing the world about what is really going on uh, in the Gaza Strip. It's an extraordinary story of, of, of courage, of, of dedication, of professionalism. And one we have to add that will never, ever, ever be properly acknowledged by the propagandists and hacks posing as politicians, uh, sorry, uh, po hacks posing as journalists in the Western mainstream media. Indeed, and this is uh, something we have seen consistently. I mean, you will recall back in towards, I think it's the end of October last year, um, you saw on the front page of the Jerusalem Post pictures of, you know, Palestinian guards and many of them journalists, bloggers, bloggers, being held up as Hamas, and you could sort of see what was going to happen there. Um, and so this is um, not just something they did recently, it's you know, something they've been planning to do for a long time. You know, um, again, but, uh, yeah. again, you know, if Israel were to tell these people the moon is made out of cheese, probably half these journalists would then send a serious request to the Israeli military spokesman um, uh, asking whether it is uh, Chauda or uh, Rokfor, you know, hopeless. Uh, well, if NASA disagrees, NASA will be classed as Hamas. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we do have to um, move on now because we've got, um, you know, in the last few days, we've seen multiple attacks on schools and hospitals, um, including two schools in Sheikh Radwan neighborhood in Gaza City, um, which you know, the death toll currently is somewhere up in a region of 30 people were killed, but that number could change. Um, and there was also Al-Aqsa Hospital, which was struck by Israel, and that was just in the last few days. Um, and indeed, since July 2024, UNRWA has reported that there's been 70% of schools in Gaza have been struck by Israel. But we seem to be seeing, you know, something of an increase as time goes on in the attacks yeah. on schools and hospitals. What do you account for this rise? The normalization of terror, um, the normalization of genocide. It's, it's unfortunately that simple. You know, um, um, Israel, uh, and I think it's a little different than others in its, uh, in its class, um, uh, if you will. Um, Israel, because external support um, and public acquiescence is of strategic importance to Israel, if you were to compare it to virtually any other country, um, it tends to proceed carefully uh, with these matters. You know, it doesn't just go in and, and, and flatten um, 
an entire uh, uh, territory in the space of an afternoon, the way, let's say, the Americans would do in, uh, in Vietnam. Um, it proceeds gradually, you know, it'll, it'll push a bit at the door, then it'll wait to see what the reaction is. Is there any pushback? No, then it will push a little harder. And if there's still no pushback, only then will it kick the door in and, you know, spray bullets on anyone and everything on the other side. Um, it is always, Israel has always escalated um, initially, gradually, and then and then um, uh, full out. And so what we have what we have seen in the Gaza Strip is, you know, Israel carries out an attack on the school. Its apologists and flunkies, um, they don't see the um, uh, dead children, uh, the beheaded um, civilians, and so on. No, um, they see the invisible. Uh, Hamas um, uh, commanders who were supposedly there, that's all they see. Um, and and when Israel finds that it's so easy to maintain the support of the United States and other Western governments, simply by saying it was Hamas, it was Hamas, it was Hamas, well, then it understands that these kinds of mass killings and atrocious war crimes have been normalized, have been legitimized. And then it begins attacking hospitals, schools, um, designated safe zones, and so on, half the time without even going through the motions of providing a pretext or, or, or excuse uh, for doing so. That's how this has worked. And what we've seen now is an intensification on the bombing of designated uh, refugee center. And of course, if, if there is any challenge um, uh, to its actions. It'll say it was Hamas. Well, you know, the argument that Israel has made is that Hamas has um, uh, chosen to um, hide assets in civilian structures because it knows that Israel, the most moral army in the solar system, um, will not attack uh, such uh, such targets out of an extraordinary care for the sanctity of Palestinian life. You know, if Hamas um, uh, genuinely believed that placing its assets in schools and hospitals would protect them from Israeli military attack, if it genuinely believed that, it wouldn't exist anymore. Because there has been a systematic, a, a pattern of systematic attacks on um, schools, hospitals, civilian objects, and so on. Not since October 7th, going back years, if not decades. And so um, a Hamas strategy to seek to defend its military, protect its military assets, by placing them in, in such um, uh, sites would have been an absolute failure and would have resulted in the elimination of all those assets. Um, and so, but, you know, in the Western mainstream media, to Western government officials, to the army of flunkies and apologists, all you need to say is Hamas and it's a done deal. Indeed. And my so last question, um, turning to the matters of the actual death toll, um, the Gaza Health Ministry has updated um, their death toll um, in Gaza. Um, and it says since 7th of October 2023, uh, the death toll has now reached 39,623 uh, and about 91,469 injuries. However, you know, as many people have said, um, the actual real death toll is likely to be much higher. And if we consider this sort of wide scale destruction of Gaza, displacement, and all of these sorts of things, I mean, historically, the health ministry has been a very reliable source of statistics and information. Yeah. Um, but of course, now they're in a situation where everyone has been displaced, lots of things have been destroyed, things have been moved around. And so getting the accurate level of information to a point where you're comfortable releasing it um, is much more limited now than it was back in October. Um, so with all of that in mind, how are the dead being counted? 
Yes, I mean, as I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that um, uh, the Gaza Health Ministry, which of course we have to um, uh, refer to as what is it, the Hamas-run Health Ministry in Gaza, just as of course whenever we speak of um, the U.S. the U.S. Um, uh, health Ministry in the United States and COVID, as you know, every mainstream journalist always refer to it as the MAGA-run U.S. Health Ministry. Um, and just as we always, of course, referred to the Tory run NHS in the UK, you know, we since since we since that is how we uh, uh, describe such institutions in the United States, in the United Kingdom and in Europe, that that is the only reason that we're now referring to the Ga the Hamas run Gaza health ministry. I digress. It's just something that I find um, uh, rather outrageous because you know, the Gaza, while Hamas controls political power in the Gaza Strip, um, the health ministry does not recruit its specialists and officials from the Hamas movement. Um, these are properly qualified medical and health professionals, some of whom I am sure um, uh are members of Hamas, and some of whom I am sure detest Hamas, just as um, in the NHS. Um, I am sure you have uh, members, uh, staff, who think Nigel Farage is the greatest thing since sliced bread, and others, um, uh, uh, you know, who think um, uh, he should fall overboard from his yacht. But um, anyway, so um, the... Health Ministry, as you noted, has been um, repeatedly determined to be a fully reliable source, including, I should add, um, uh, by um, Israeli intelligence. But of course, you know, next to um, uh, Israeli intelligence relying on its um, relying on its uh, statistics, you know, not only for purposes of genocidal planning, but also others. Um, then, of course, you have the Israeli uh, government um, uh, basically saying, you know, the Hamas-run health ministry, it's uh, completely unreliable. You know, <laughs> Netanyahu in the U.S. Congress got a standing ovation for saying not a single um, uh, civilian was killed in Rafah. Imagine, imagine um, some, you know, um, neo-Nazi getting a standing ovation for saying not a single Jew was killed in the Holocaust. It's it's beyond words. But um, so the Israeli government puts out these uh, statements challenging the, um, the health ministry and its statistics. And then, of course, you get its army of flunkies and apologists who um, let Israel do their thinking then start spreading all this propaganda about Pallywood and, and all the rest of it. But again, um, uh, I digress out of frustration and I do want to get back to your question. My understanding is that the Gaza Health Ministry will only record a casualty um, if that individual is actually um, uh, confirmed. In other words, um, a... a parent brings a dismembered child um, to a Palestinian hospital or health clinic, um, uh, a, um, uh, uh, someone brings in a parent or a spouse, and they are able to provide staff at those facilities with the name and identification number of the casualty, whether um, uh, killed or wounded. And only then is that individual entered into the statistics of um, that are that are um, uh, presented by uh, that are published by the health ministry. Um, the Gaza media office, from what I understand, operates according to different standards. It accepts um, uh, reports, for example, of you know. Um, uh, uh, let's say a journalist is at a site and says um, that he has uh, confirmed that 15 people uh, were killed in a particular bombing. We don't know their names. We don't know their identity numbers. We may never even 
um, uh, find their bodies buried under the rubble, those would be included in the media office's statistics. They would not be considered confirmed casualties by the Ministry of Health because they need the personal identifying um, uh, information. And of course, um, the health ministry is operating under impossible circumstances. First of all, it has diminished human capacity, you know, because its own staff are being uh, um, uh, attacked and, and targeted and in many, you know, severely overworked. They have less means and resources at their disposal. So, and, and the, the entire health infrastructure of the Gaza Strip, of course, has been systematically targeted um, uh, for thorough obliteration. And that explains the inconsistency. Um, also, when you look at the situation on the ground, you know, there are thousands of corpses of Palestinians buried under the rubble, virtually all of whom, unfortunately, must be considered um, uh, dead, and many of whom will never even be found. Um, advanced states of decomposition, um, uh, movement of rubble by Israeli bulldozers, and we've seen many, you know, uh, numerous images of Israel simply um, scooping up bodies and tossing them uh, wherever. Um, people, you know, uh, dying at, at home and being buried at home, and 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 those cases not being reported to any medical facility. So, yeah, sure. Think of thirty nine thousand, uh, however hundred, as as a Hollywood exaggeration, uh, if you will, but recognize that the act the current actual number of um, uh, casualties is most likely already at least twice as high as what is being reported uh, by the um, uh, Gaza uh, Health Ministry. And when you take into account um, uh, what else we don't know about, and when you take into account what we should reasonably expect on a conservative basis, as, as, as recently published in uh, the British Medical Journal, The Lancet, um, we're not talking about thousands or tens of thousands. We're talking about hundreds of thousands um, uh, Palestinians killed in this genocidal campaign by Israel in the Gaza Strip. Moin, it's a great pleasure to bring you on and to, you know, talk to us about all of these issues. Um, but we have now come to, the end, come to the end of our time. So thank you for talking to us. Thank you. It's a pleasure. And to our audience, thank you for tuning in. Please do tune in next week for more um, Memo in uh, Palestine this week with uh, will be Nasi Mahmed and Moin Rabani. Thank you very much. Thank you.